Father, I too want to just add my voice of prayer in this moment. I ask that you would bless the remainder of this service as we think about your love for us, your sacrifice, and the message that you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to all of our servants, our volunteers, those that help with our services. Um, it's always a joy uh, to be part of this community and this family when we come together for worship. There is a, a phrase, now I'm a child of the 80s, and uh, there are stories that uh, passed by during my growing up that locked themselves in, in my min- memory, and I don't know if, if they were as prevalent or if they connect with others, but if out of the blue you were to tell me the phrase, do you understand the phrase, passing the rope, I would have an answer to that. Um, I, I would know the meaning of that phrase uh, because of, of the story that is associated uh, with, uh, with that phrase uh, that I grew up with, and um, that's going to be kind of the topic of my message today. Um, but knowing that our, uh, this is a little bit of a, of a unique moment because both the Children's Church happening and then with Alumni Weekend, we don't have a lot of young people. I usually switch to teen trivia when it's Children's Church, but most of our teens are, are uh, uh, worshiping with Alumni Weekend or helping with Children's Church. So we're going to kind of just open this up. You can all be teens today. Everybody's a teen. Is that okay? You're like, no, I don't want to be a teen. I'm done with being a teen. No, we're all going to participate. So if, could I get um, someone to help with mics? Do we have any? Can I use this? Or can I use these mics? Brendan and Basti, you guys taking the mics, look at you. Thank you, Edwin, and thank you, Coach Alex. Just like it so that for our recording and so everyone can hear. Uh, My questions today, and for those of you who are new, I always begin with kind of an interactive trivia to the beginning of my messages, usually geared for young people and kids, but on unique times, we, we just do it together as a church. So because of the phrase passing the rope, I chose questions related to ropes and bindings and cords and things like that in the Bible just to get us kind of the mind flowing. Tell me if you know who this is referring to. Then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city of the wall. Joshua 2.15. Who who are we talking about? Wendy has her hand up. So Wendy, are we talking about Rachel, Rebecca, Rahab, or Ruth? All R's there. It's Rahab. That is the story of Rahab, a a very interesting individual in the Bible. I look forward to meeting her in heaven someday. Uh, Very, very interesting. Next one. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so mightily that the ropes that were on his arms were as flax as burned in the fire. We've all been there. I know that. And his bonds dropped from his hands. Joshua 15, 14. Is this Gideon? Samson, David, Samuel, I'm giving you some options here. Who are we talking about here? Who, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, the bindings did not hold him back. Is there someone that I'm seeing? Oh, Antonio. Uh, Samson. It is Samson. Did you say that with the Spanish accent? (laughs) Samson. 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 (laughs) Yes, of course, that's the story of Samson. Uh, uh, And there's actually several stories of Samson uh, uh, in a similar setting where he says, if you bind me with new ropes, and uh, he was kind of toying with Delilah. This next one, this is a more obscure one, I'll admit. Um, I'll, be, I'll be really impressed if you, if you know this one ready, readily. He said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord. It was like a necklace that he would keep his, his seal. That was like his credit card. You would use your seal when you'd make purchases or sign agreements. And your staff that's in your hand. So he gave them to her, and he went into her, and she conceived by him. Who are we talking about? Jacob or Esau? Judah or Joseph? Did someone? All right, yeah, back here. Sometimes we refer to him as the uh, prodigal patriarch. Jacob? Oh, no. <laughs> nice, nice try. It's, it's very Jacob-like, I'll admit that. Judah. Our, our wise head elder has settled it for debate. It would be Jacob's son, Judah. Genesis 38 is a dedicated chapter kind of out of the blue to this one story of Judah, uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, But in this story, it is Judah who had that cord with his seal, the rope. All right, moving to the New Testament. So Anna sent him him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Who did they bind? 
Was it John the Baptist, Peter? Was there, is this referring to Barabbas or to our Lord Jesus Christ? Who is this a reference of? They sent him bound. Who's the him? Oh, Betty. John the Baptist. <laughs> oh. <laughs> would be incorrect. <laughs> Who was arrested and sent on trial back and forth between all kinds of situations? Jesus. It Jesus. is Jesus. It is Jesus. Where it actually references that he had been uh, uh, tied up, he'd been bound. Uh, the portrayal of him wearing those big iron chains in different movies is probably a little over the top. All right, uh, I think this is the last one. His disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him with ropes, we would assume, in a large basket. Who was saved with a basket and being lowered by his disciples by rope? Is this Paul, Silas, Stephen, or James? I actually talked about this a few weeks ago in one of my sermons, uh, just incidentally. But whose story is this about? Anyone know who we're talking about? Oh, Betty thinks she knows now. <laughs> Paul? Yes, this is one of those stories of Paul. And just growing up in church, going to Sunday school or Sabbath school, I don't know, for some reason, this was one that uh, was loved to be included. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Edwin. You can just put the mics, uh, or actually give them back to Brendan and Basti. That would be great. Thank you, guys. On January 13th, 1982, Air Florida Flight 90 left Washington National uh, Airport in Washington, D.C. for a scheduled flight to Tampa. Um, it never reached its destination. This is one of those stories that is uh, a tragedy, but there are things that can be learned from it. This flight was piloted by two young pilots. Larry Wheaton is the one on your left. He was the captain. Roger Pettit is on the right. At the time of January 13th, Larry Wheaton was 34 and Roger Pettit was 31. Um, these pictures, they, they look like Academy kids in these pictures. They're not current with 1982. They were the best available pictures uh, when this incident took place, but they were young. 34 and 31, they had lots of flight experience in good weather, but they had very, very little flight experience in bad weather, particularly in snow and ice. And on January 13th, 1982, in Washington, D.C., they had an all-out blizzard. This is an actual photograph of the plane um, just shortly before its takeoff. Um, from Washington National Airport. It's now, by, by the way, called Ronald Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C. Now, through a series of mistakes, and as the uh, incident was investigated, they determined that procedures were not followed, the pilots showed their inexperience, uh, and also there was not good coordination between the captain and first officer in the uh, preparation for this challenging flight in a blizzard condition. They took off at 4 p.m., um, and within 20 seconds into liftoff, uh, the plane did not succeed in continuing on its journey. The last words recorded by the flight recorder that was recovered after the incident, um, there's a series of discussions between the pilot, uh, between the captain and the first officer, but the last words are first officer Roger Pettit saying, Larry, we're going down, and then you can hear Larry, the captain, in a obviously panic voice say, I know. And the very next sound you hear is a crash. Less than 20 seconds into its takeoff, um, reaching no more than an altitude of 350 feet, traveling less than a mile, the engine stalled and Air Florida Flight 90 crashed. It initially struck the 14th Street Bridge, one of the, uh, there's a whole session of bridges that cross the Potomac River uh, from Washington, D.C. to Virginia. It struck the 14th Street Bridge first, um, killing immediately four motorists and injuring many others on the bridge. Uh, and then it continued on its way, plunging into the icy waters of the Potomac. The plane came apart. 
Uh, the tail section was torn off, and um, it was a devastating wreck. This is a CGI, computer-generated uh, illustration of what the wreck may have looked like. Um, the, the picture before that, they actually made a made-for-TV movie about this incident in 1984. So the picture showing it hitting the bridge, that was from the movie poster and then the drawing of it. But when you watch this CGI, you know, again, recreation of the incident and you see it happen, it makes you wonder, how could anyone have survived that? How could anyone have survived this terrible wreck? Well, out of the 79 individuals on that plane, 74 passengers and five crew, when the plane crashed, sadly, 73 of them were immediately or nearly immediately killed. Some of them survived briefly but had tremendous injuries and, and died shortly after the wreck. This is all after an exhausting recovery effort and investigation and analysis but there were six, six individuals who, when the tail section broke off of the plane, they were seated in the back of the plane who were flung into the river and survived. They land in 34-degree ice-choked waters of the Potomac. Here there's actually um, five of them that's very hard to see. The fifth one is, is almost impossible to see. The sixth one is actually just floating and holding on to some flotsam just outside of this. This is a still of a video uh, that was taken. Now, this is 1982. This isn't the dark ages. This is Washington, D.C. So right, and this is 4 o'clock in the, in the afternoon. So immediately when this uh, accident takes place, there are bystanders and journalists everywhere. Now, this is long before the cell phone era when everyone has a video camera, but there were cameras and there was video, and you can go online and watch um, a lot of this and read up on it and, and, and brush up on, on the reality of this wreck, and, and maybe you'll remember certain portions of it um, as it was, a, a, again, a, a major a story and, and thing that took place in, uh, in the 80s. But there were six survivors. Uh, now the problem is they are in the middle of the Potomac in 34-degree water. How are you going to get them? Um, bystanders, you can see them standing off on the side here. This is, again, just seconds after, well, no, excuse me, the helicopter's there, so this is minutes after. But in the moments after the wreck, obviously people are recovering from the shock, and they see people in the water, and they know they can't survive in the water, and they're trying to figure out how to get these people. Uh, one gentleman stripped down to the waist and dove into the water thinking he could swim out to them, but in 34-degree water, it's one thing just to float. It's another thing to exert, injury, uh, excuse me, to exert energy, and at about 30 feet, he became in completely incapacitated and nearly had to be rescued himself, was barely able to make it back. Other people tried to create lifelines. They, grabbed, they took off their belts. They took off their T-shirts. Some people grabbed jumper cables to try to lengthen it, trying to throw rope out them, but they're 100, 150 feet out there. There's no length of rope that could be created to get to those people way out in the Potomac. And so there they sat, broken, bruised, bewildered. All of them have serious injuries. I'm going to go back a picture here. This gentleman in blue, it's a very hazy uh, um, uh, because of the projection. His name is Joe Stiley. Both his legs are broken. His arm is broken. All 10 of his fingers are broken in addition to internal injuries. There were three ladies and three men. Most of them were blinded or semi-blinded temporarily because of the fumes and because of the, um, uh, you know, the explosion and everything. Desperate, absolutely desperate. How will these individuals in this tragic moment be saved? Well, after 20 excruciating minutes in that water, okay, that would be in eternity, right? 20 minutes, finally, a uh, police park rescue helicopter came on the scene. Now, there were rescue boats on the Potomac, but they had already been responding to other emergencies, and they were so far down, they weren't available, and was unlikely they could have reached it as well. This helicopter became their only chance of rescue. So after 20 minutes, they show up. But this is not the U.S. Coast Guard. These are not Navy SEALs. This is basically an air ambulance. Normally, it would land somewhere, pick up the injured person, put them in the helicopter, and take them to the hospital. They had no aquatic rescue gear nor training for this type 
of rescue. They really, even though they have a helicopter, they're not sure how are they going to get these six people out of the water. Now, I like that there are so many stories of heroism on days like this. It, you, we could spend all day, but I'm just picking out a few. Uh, the, the gentleman on the left, he was the pilot. His name's Donald Usher. He was a Vietnam vet where he had flown helicopters uh, throughout the war. He was an expert pilot, and it, would, it, and it showed on this day. He did things with his helicopter um, that were not recommended, that were dangerous, but saved lives. He would lower the helicopter so low, the skids actually would go into the water, which is very dangerous. Any gust of wind or change in, director, in direction could have caused that helicopter to crash itself, but they were so desperate to try to save these people. The paramedic with them, his name is Melvin Windsor. He went by the name Gene. Um, he was the paramedic. He would actually jump down onto the skids of the helicopter. Oh, there's a picture of it. With no rescue line. I mean, he's literally just standing there, and he, they, they try to grab people out of the water at first because, again, they have no rescue gear. All they think they can do is just grab people out of the water. But if you can imagine, these people are nearly dead. They're broken. They have no strength. They're soaking wet. Ice is forming in their hair. They probably weigh 250 or 300 pounds from the water and ice. Picking them up out of the water was nearly impossible. Now, actually, the picture that is shown there is one of the last rescue, rescues. This is Nikki Felch being pulled out of the water. Um, Gene was able to put his foot on the skid, pull her up onto his foot, lean back, and he said, all right, Donald, I got her. Let's get back. And they were able to get her back to shore. But that, that was very late in the rescue and was kind of the last act of desperation. So before that time, they had to figure out, what are we going to do and so they did have some rope. They had some rope. They, were, they found some flotation devices. They, they tried to get them available. Um, the only surviving member of the crew, her name is Kelly Duncan. She was the flight attendant at the very back of the plane, 22 years old, um, uh, finds herself in the water. She found the only flotation device. You guys know what it's like to be in a plane, right? And, and they go through all that safety stuff. Right? And normally, you put on your earbuds and you just kind of do your thing, right? Because you, if you've flown before, you've heard it. Um, so in this incident, the, the, the flotation devices were not available, but she found one and she gave it to a passenger. And she was actually cited for her heroism for giving up the only flotation device that was uh, initially found in the wreckage. But they were able to find a few other life rings and throw them to people um, and try to use that. But the main instrument that they used was rope. They had a length of rope. And they would drop this rope down, trying to create loops and trying to pull people out of the water. It was not easy. The very first individual to be rescued, I've forgotten his name, it was Ben uh, something. As they drug him through the water, he was actually breaking ribs as he would bump into the ice and the debris. Uh, desperate, absolutely desperate. Um, this is actually Kelly Duncan, uh, the one that's hanging from the rope there on the left. Um, as she is being rescued. Um, and then, and actually, Kelly's story is quite remarkable. She's 22 years old. She's a self-described party girl. She had spent the previous weekend in Florida drinking and partying it up. She, she, she talks about how she had really a very casual regard of life and just, you know, um, and Air Florida had a, had a, a habit of hiring young and, and, and individuals. They're Florida, right? They want to look young. They want to look sexy and all that. Um, and she fit that culture well. But she talks about how when she was sitting in the water there, 22 years old, she remembers saying, God, I'm not ready to die. And she had a moment where she said, the peace of God came over me. She had a life-altering moment. She gave her life to Christ. She's still an active Christian today. She lives in the Seattle area. She has a family, three boys that are now grown. And she has, this was a monumental moment in her life that drew her to faith. The story of the lady on the right is not so uh, remarkable. And it's interesting how tragedies can affect people in different ways. Her name is Priscilla Torado. She's also 22 years old, same age as, as Kelly Duncan. Sadly, her story is on that plane was also her husband, and her nine-week-old son named Jason, and they perished. And she was in a panic, obviously. But the interesting and the dramatic story of this, this moment that you see her holding onto the life ring, um, right after this moment, she loses her grip. 
and she absolutely goes into the water and she's gone. She is drowned. She's gone. But at the very last, and you can watch the video of this, by the way. It's, it's dramatic. I didn't want to mess with the technology too much. I thought the CGI thing was pushing it. So, uh, But you can watch the video. At the very last second, you see out of the corner of the screen, you see a guy jump in the water and just tear towards her and, and literally go into the water and pull her up. She was dead. She had no energy left. She was gone. But he, by the way, and this was not a first responder. This was not a lifeguard or a paramedic. His name was Lenny Skutnik. He actually worked for the Congressional Budget Office. By the way, so next time you're angry at our government for not budgeting well, there are good people. So Lenny Skutnik dives in the water. He pulls her up. And by the way, if you don't have training, it's hard to pull someone up in the water without drowning yourself. And it's evident in the video, he's struggling because, you know, when you pull someone up in water, you go down, right? Um, but he heroically jumps in the water, pulls her up, gets her close enough that eventually firefighters can get, and, and saves her life. But in her case, uh, uh, she was extremely, obviously, you know, would be scarred by this, but she's never really recovered from what I understand, continues to be quite scarred and reclusive, obviously losing her husband, her child, um, uh, but her life her life was spared. Lenny Skutnik was actually honored um, by Reagan at the um, State of the Union address that took place just a few weeks after this. So there he is, Lenny Skutnik, um, being uh, recognized uh, just a few weeks after. So, so many stories, but one of the more pronounced stories that carries uh, a memory along with this among the many who did. Again, Donald Usher and, and Gene Windsor, they were also honored for their heroism, for what they did. They received honors from the Coast Guard and from the president and all kinds of things. Wonderful. Uh, but there was a sixth individual in the water. And for a long while, they did not know who he was. He was simply referred to as the unknown man or the sixth man in the water. Now, you can't see it well at all, but again, this is a still of a video. If you watch the video, you can see him moving slightly. And in another picture, it's very hard to see, but you can. He was actually tangled in some gear. He was actually, his seatbelt became fastened and he couldn't get it unfastened, which again is when they tell you on a plane, make sure you fasten your belt. You're like, well, it doesn't always work out, does it? Um, but he's kind of tangled, so he's low in the water. But what was significant about this individual is, and Gene Windsor tells the story, the paramedic on the uh, helicopter had the best uh, viewpoint of this because, you know, the pilot, he's looking around, he has to fly. Gene is looking down on this group. He sees them clearly. And because this individual seemed to be in greater distress but was more alert, they would always pass the rescue line to him. They thought that he would be the next one to be saved. They passed him life preservers. He handed them away. They passed him the lifeline, and every time the line came to him, he passed it to someone else. And they did not know who he was. They knew the, the manifest who, who, of who was on the plane. But to positively identify this individual, again, the, the National Traffic Safety Board, the Coast Guard, and, and all the investigators had to go through a very significant recovery process before they could finally determine conclusively who the sixth man in the water was. And it took months, but they finally determined that it was Arlen D. Williams Jr. He was 46 years old. He had a family, a young family. He had a 17-year-old daughter and a young son, I believe, that lived in Florida. He was a bank examiner, and he was on his way home on this flight. And he was the one who every time the rope came to him, he passed it to someone else. Now, uh, again, Gene Windsor has been interviewed many times and continues to tell a consistent story of this um, happening. Um, this is the next day after the wreck. The Washington Post, not knowing who he is, wrote this. He was about 50 years old, one of half a dozen survivors clinging to twisted wreckage, bobbing in the icy Potomac when the helicopter arrived. To the two-man park police crew, he seemed the most alert. Life vests were dropped and a flotation ball. The man passed them to others. On two occasions, the crew recalled last night, he handed away a lifeline from the hovering machine that could have dragged him to safety. 
The helicopter crew who rescued five people, the only persons who survived from the jetliner, lifted a woman to the riverbank then dragged three more persons of, across the ice to safety. Then the lifeline saved a woman who was trying to swim away. That was uh, Nikki Felch that was pulled up on his uh, foot on the skids of the, the helicopter um, from the sinking wreckage. And then helicopter pilot Donald Usher returned once more to the scene, but by then the man was gone. By the time they came to rescue him, the, the, the records had shifted and his entanglement pulled him under, and he was the only one to drown on that tragic day. But Gene Windsor tells the story, and, and, and you, again, you can find his testimony. He says, time and time again, we gave him the rope and watched him every time pass the rope away. Two weeks later, in Time magazine, Roger Rosenblatt wrote, So the man in the water had his own natural powers. He could not make ice storms or freeze the water until it froze the blood, but he could hand life over to a stranger. And that is a power of nature, too. The man in the water pitted himself against an implacable and personal enemy. He fought it with charity. He held it to a standoff. He was the best that we can do. Now, Reagan honored him and his family. The bridge actually was renamed. It was called the Rochambeau Bridge uh, before that, uh, after the, the French general that helped in the Revolutionary War. Uh, it's actually been renamed the Arlen D. Williams Bridge and is still there in Washington, D.C. today that crosses the Potomac. But the story of this man who repeatedly, given the opportunity to save himself, given the opportunity to use the life-saving measures that were handed to him, has been lauded and repeated and been celebrated for the last 40 plus years. And in the context of our Savior and our Lord, it stands as a, a wonderful reminder that He exemplified the character of Christ. Multiple times as Jesus hung on the cross, a lifeline was offered Him. Those passing by, these are the Jews, were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Now, could Jesus have saved himself? That wasn't necessarily meant to be rhetorical. I mentioned in Sabbath school, he told Pilate, I could call to my disposal a legion of angels at any time. He absolutely could have saved himself, but he passed the rope along. Again, in the same way, the chief priests also with the scribes and elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. But he passed the rope along. Even the soldiers mocked him. These Roman pagan soldiers coming up to him, they offered him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews... Save yourself. But he passed the rope along. And finally, in almost ultimate mockery, even one of the criminals who was crucified next to him cried out and, and was hurling abuse at him. Again, these are mockeries and accusations. But he too said, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But you see, here was the crux of the matter. He could not save himself and us at the same time. The only way we have salvation is because he chose not to save himself. He chose to pass the rope along. He chose to take the pathway of salvation that was offered to him, that he had the power to take, but he said, no, I will put these individuals ahead of myself. I will not take this offer of salvation. I am going to pass the rope along. And you and I are the beneficiaries of his salvation. You and I and everyone who has accepted his sacrifice were those who received that rope and have been brought to safety because Jesus 
chose to give his life for his fellow man. In Arlen Williams' case, they were strangers. Even after the rescue, when they were trying to identify, who was the man in the water? Nikki Felch, you were there. Kelly Duncan, you were there. Joe Stiley, you were there. Who was the man? They said, we don't know. We don't know his name. There were actually two other passengers on that plane that had similar features. Glasses, roughly the same age, kind of balding, very handsome like me. Um, very, you know, looking similar. And they said, we can't, they would show them pictures. Was it this guy? Was it this guy? Or was it this guy? They're like, we were blind in the water. We were desperate. We were freezing to death. We don't know. He was a stranger to us and we were a stranger to him. All we know is that he passed us the rope and he died. And we are alive. Jesus passes us the rope out of his great love for us. I want to read, and I'm just going to read this. I don't have it on the screen. Um, A passage you know, Philippians chapter 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but for the interests of of others and have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God he did not regard his equality with God as something to be asserted but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men being found in the appearance of a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and those on earth and even under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as my, in, my, in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God, listen to this, I know I've been reading a lot, Philippians 2.13, it is God who is at work in you. It is God who is at work in you. It was God at work in Arlen Williams when he chose to pass the rope. It was God at work in Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And it's God who is at work in you every time you put others ahead of yourself. Have this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus. He emptied himself, and he put others before himself. Beautiful, beautiful illustrations and reminders of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I thank God that through the tragedy of this so many deaths that day, so many stories, and yet in the midst of that, you have one individual who exemplified the highest character. We have been past the rope of salvation. Our salvation has been secured because of Jesus. Let's also be willing to pass the rope. Pass the rope. Put others ahead of yourself. Follow the example of Jesus. He's your Lord. He's your Savior. Your salvation is secure. But what will you do to make sure others are saved as well? I will never hear the phrase passing the rope without thinking of this story. And I hope you also will remember it. We're going to sing a song. Brendan Basti, thank you so much.
let's sing about how Jesus paid it all as we close our service.